Welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast, the podcast where we explore the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. Join us as we delve into topics such as consciousness, spirituality, and personal growth with expert guests and thought-provoking discussions. Get ready to expand your mind and discover new insights on this journey of self-discovery. Now here's your host, Peter Michael Deeds. Joining us today is Tracy Fance, a beacon of light in the world of spiritual and personal development with a lifelong passion for all things spiritual. Tracy has seamlessly integrated her spiritual journey into a thriving career dedicated to helping others heal and grow, and through her unique blend of intuitive coaching, healing practices, and spiritual guidance, she empowers individuals to overcome chronic health issues and tap into their inner wisdom and transform their lives from the inside out. Tracy, a very warm welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. Your journey into spirituality and healing seems to have come from deep roots dating back to your childhood. Can you share a bit about your early years and what initially sparked your interest in the spiritual realm? Okay, I'm a big believer that our spiritual side is signposted to us. So when I was five and having weird experiences that obviously my five-year-old self made sense of in a child's way, I didn't really know what all of this was. My family would be classed as muggles these days if you're into Harry Potter, especially my father. He's very no-nonsense. If I can't see it, taste it, hear it, feel it, it doesn't exist. I just kept a real fascination with everything paranormal. And honestly, I truly have no idea where that came from. So that just shows how much kids can find what they need to, even if it's not in their world. As I grew up, I just kept this fascination with ghost hunts and spontaneous combustion, UFOs, reincarnation and past lives was my massive thing. I absolutely still fascinated with that. And then when I got to my 20s, I spent my time going, oh, my God, it would be like so amazing to be psychic, not realizing that we are all psychic. We just sometimes need to know what that looks like and feels. And then from that point on, I figured it out and started learning and getting to grips with it, mostly just as a hobby and an interest. And then when my financial services business went in the recession of 2009 and I didn't have anything else to fall back on, it was like, maybe I'll get my tarot cards out. And then it all went from there, really. Transitioning from childhood fascination with spirituality and wanting to be psychic to making it your life's work would have likely presented itself with its own set of challenges What were some of the obstacles you faced along the way and how did you navigate them? Okay, so the obvious one is that society thought this was all a load of rubbish or taboo and wouldn't tell anyone that you went for a reading because they think you're mad. Coupled with not having a great deal of confidence back then, which I've dealt with, so that's been a big thing. And I would say also, and this is something I find with a lot of people these days, we're raised to be logical. We're not raised to be intuitive. And so the work that I was doing at that point of my life was incredibly left brain logical, not right brain fluffy. And so that was hard for me to get used to. And once I'd managed to not even swap from logical because I'm still logical now, there is stuff where I need to be logical, but I can alternate between the left brain logical and the right brain creative and fluffy and intuitive. And I think a lot of the people that I teach, they really struggle with that because it's just quite a foreign concept. And I would say that probably the most intuitive are the mums, because honest to God, if they think there's something wrong with their child, they will walk over hot coals to make sure that there's nothing going on. And I think policemen use intuition, doctors probably make intuitive leaps. So we all do have it, but a lot of people wouldn't refer to it as that. I like to think of it as our inner tuition, because it's like a personal guide inside of us. It's there, whispering wisdom. And if we only learn to listen, to really hear it beyond the chatter 
of our analytical left brain because it's about tuning into life's deeper rhythms and the spiritual side is just as real as the rest of it. And intuition for me is something that's been pushed aside. We grow up, we go to school, we get fed into the system that's more about fulfilling an economic imperative than getting a true education. But imagine if education was really about exploring that inner voice, those psychic whispers that we all have. And it's about recognising the amazing human technology we're born with, which I find absolutely incredible. And then there's the cosmic connection, our very essence from the calcium in our bones to the iron in our blood. It's all stardust. We're literally made of the cosmos. Yeah, it's true. And I think that over the years, things have shifted. When I was doing this, which is what, back in 2010, it was like 99% women that came to me for readings, for training, for anything. And it's still predominantly women, but there are more men on both sides of the fence. So those giving readings and healing, as well as those that are having readings. And I would say it's still probably 85, 90% women. And I think I'm being generous by saying 85% because I suspect it's still nearer to 90. But men are getting a bit more on board with it. They are finding ways to be able to tap into their intuitive side without all the labels that go with it that are incredibly unfair and not really necessary either. So I'm glad that it is changing, but it feels slow and painfully slow. It is slow. It is painful. But one of the things that I recognised when I was growing up, I was a sensitive type. I was intuitive. And it's funny because my looks didn't match up with that image. It was more brawn than you'd expect from someone who was so in tune with the vibes around them. And I could sense people's energies I could sense the mood of a place like I was tapping into something beyond the usual. And it was like stepping out of this solid world into something lighter where things aren't bound by the same rules. So it's not about gravity anymore. It's about this other kind of force, almost ethereal. And the understandings that come to me come in a flash, like a silent conversation. Now, you've mentioned that your hobby of all things spiritual became your business. Could you elaborate on some of the steps that you took to turn your passion into a successful career? What were some of the pivotal decisions or actions that you took during this time? Getting my tarot cards out was fairly major because it was something I just dabbled, did as a bit of a party trick. Having to get to grips with that really quickly and with any new skill, you go through this learning curve where it's uncomfortable and then it becomes second nature. And that was short and sharp and not necessarily sweet. In hindsight, some of the decisions I made, I didn't have any end use for. It just felt right. So I just trusted my intuition. So, for instance, I qualified as a Reiki master and teacher, and I never wanted to teach. I was just like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. But it felt right, and I did it. And now, ironically, I probably teach Reiki more than any of the stuff that I offer. And in that process is where I discovered the healer in me, because I did the NFSH healing, which for those in the UK is the National Federation of Spiritual Healers. And you had to jump through hoops every year and prove to them that you could do it. It's not like driving a car. It's down to the recipient. And I just found that too rigid. And Reiki was a lot less rigid. But through that, I really started latching on to the mind-body connection. And even in readings, that comes up. There's a block in your throat chakra, what's going on in your life that's creating that block. And then then the next step is, why are you getting all these throat problems? Oh, it's because there's a block in your throat chakra because of X, Y, and Z that you need to heal. So it's expanded from this little tiny pinprick of interest into almost the whole of it, because you can't separate mind, body, or spirit. They are all part and parcel of the same thing. And so, therefore, if you're going to do work on one, it's going to affect the other two. Besides the tarot, was there an epiphany 
Or was there a specific moment or experience that served as a turning point in your spiritual and professional journey, something that really solidified your path and your purpose? I can't say that there was any one thing, but I think multiple people coming to me either for a second reading or because they've been recommended or for the workshops, same thing, where they were going, oh my God, that was life-changing. Or my best friend said her reading with you was life-changing and I need a reading. It's that understanding of how much difference we can make to someone's life, even if it doesn't seem that big at the actual time. I can't think of any one specific thing but lots of people over the years. One lady came last week. I haven't seen her for 10 years, which is quite scary. And her reading that she had 10 years ago was so pivotal that she didn't need another one for a long time. And it's only now things have changed quite dramatically again that she needed me again. But it was great that she remembered me after 10 years and that I'd had such an amazing effect on her life. I'm sure she didn't tell me the half of it because we haven't got time in a reading. But I think stuff like that is the standout stuff. You offer a range of healing practices and spiritual services. How do you feel your journey has prepared you for the work that you're doing now? I think everything is signposted. So I followed the signposts to get me to doing this work. And then all of that apprenticeship that I did that everyone else calls real life, I brought to the table because I had no confidence. I had an upbringing that didn't align with how I needed to have emotions expressed. And obviously my mum and dad have got their own baggage and they're just playing that out. I had a really interesting upbringing when you look at everything that happened and even just my careers. I still bring them to a healing session or a reading now. And I've done timeshare, financial services, a state agency, looked after old people, worked in a butcher's. It's amazing how much that stuff can really help me to help someone. And I can't think of any examples off the top of my head. But I know that there are times when I've been shown a memory from my life and then I've been able to use that to explain something to a client and it's made perfect sense. And that can be a a physical thing, an emotional thing, or a spiritual thing. When you reflect on the origin of your story, it's clear to me that your lifelong passion for spirituality and healing has led you into a fulfilling career in the healing arts and guiding others. What advice would you give to someone who's just starting their journey in spirituality and personal development? To a large extent, go with the flow, because unless you desperately know that you want to be a medical medium or get up and do platform medium or whatever it is. Honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I just started getting involved in all of this. And as I said, I did the Reiki and I was like, I don't ever know what I want to do with it. And it's landed me where I am now, but it's also brought me all this other stuff. So just dabble, go and have a play with crystals and you might go, oh, they don't really do anything for me. But it's not been wasted because there'll be something you've learned about crystals. And then you might go and try, I don't know, sound healing. And you might go, well, I kind of like it, but I don't love it. And you just try the different stuff and something will make you go, oh my God, I love this is what I want to do. Or you might come from the opposite where you look at your life, let's say you've had lots of mental health issues personally or around you. Sometimes it's not about you, it's about the others. And you might go, wow, what can I do that could really serve that community? And you might go, oh, do you know what? I need to learn to do yoga because it helps them to lose their anxiety or I need to work with people doing sound healing or whatever it is. So sometimes we've got the community we want to serve, but we're just scratching our heads going, I don't know how I want to do that. And not everybody wants to be a doctor or nurse, but there's so many different ways you can help people who've got mental health issues without being a nurse or a doctor. So I would jump in. When I say have a play, do it carefully. You do need the right people to guide you so that you work safely until you know what you're doing. It's the same with our career paths. I bet you've had umpteen different jobs over the years. It's not because you're flaky. It's just you do that and you go, yeah, that's not for me. I'll go and try that. And you might like that for five years. But then for five years, you're like, yeah, I'm done now. I need to go and do something different. 
because some people just need variety or we need to have like a GP, a very broad knowledge base, but we don't necessarily need to specialize in all of those mm. to be able to be effective, but we can know enough to pass them on to someone else that does have that knowledge. So sometimes people will come to me and then on to someone else, but they needed me as the connector because I'm a good networker. So I know a lot of people, so I know where to send them that I know they're in safe hands. Sometimes you just need to just go with the flow and see what happens careers advice back in school right i remember that and options were so limited back then especially in the late 70s there was a doctor dentist fireman policeman and none of those felt right for me they just didn't match up with where my head was at so i ended up trying a bit of everything while i studied in further education things that really resonated with me like psychology and behavioral science as it was called back in the day but I drove cabs, I worked construction, I waited tables, I operated my own studios, I actually sold my studio, you name it. But all those jobs and the business that I had gave me a unique insight and perspective on people because I could do a really deep dive into human psychology and behavior in all sorts of scenarios in terms of relationships and money and careers but I was told to focus, but I just couldn't, not until later. But when I did, I got really good at what I did and I turned it into a business. And any spiritual or healing practice is a business too, but it's got to be ethical and it's got to be moral, meaningful and masterful. And you need solid guidelines, principles and boundaries because it's all too easy to cross the line from facilitating healing to manipulating, especially when money's involved. Your approach to healing is very well-rounded. When I was looking at your website and when we spoke off air, I can see all the services that you offer where you address both the physical and the emotional aspects of health issues can you explain a little bit more about how you developed your approach and the various modalities you incorporate into your practice? I've always been fascinated by past lives and regression, and that's still a huge thing. So that led me to qualify as a hypnotherapist because I knew I wasn't happy doing mortgages, but I didn't have anything else in mind. So it's just like, I'll go and do that and see what happens. Then I added in NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, and that's a conversational modality. But it's all about the structure of the language that we use. Like people always say things like, oh, my relationship's killing me. That sends a message to the brain and it's not the right message. So by changing the language that people use, they can change things in their life, even though nothing specifically has changed. OK. So I added that in. And again, same thing. I'd collected another skill, but nothing was really happening. Then my financial services business went and I ended up getting my tarot cards out, added in the Reiki and everything. And then I'm of an age now where I'm losing lots of people that shouldn't be dying. My sister passed away. She didn't even make 50. And that really gutted me. Add to that, we've got a lot of people who've got long-term illnesses. Because by this time I'd gotten into the body-mind connection, I was starting to work out that there's something else going on. Because otherwise, if cigarettes cause smoking-related illnesses, everyone who smoked would get cancer and die. And that's not happening. So my brain was like, there's got to be another solution. Some of it is a spiritual mechanism. So let's take Christopher Reeves, who played Superman. He did more for spinal injuries than probably any other person on this planet. And I did actually at one point live with a guy who was a spinal injury. So I've got inside knowledge and outside knowledge on that one. And I could really see what Christopher Reeves did in the short time that he was in a wheelchair. So spiritually, his path may have been to help that community. But also your body is telling you something else is going on. So I worked out that if your beliefs are at the root of your health issues, if I just clear the beliefs, then the illness has to go. 
I've realized that it's what's happening to us daily and how that affects our beliefs and our thinking that then create the physical. Okay. I've got a really good friend who does this for a living and he's got people where he's helped them get rid of their cancer and everything else. Obviously, I'm not a doctor and I don't pretend to be, but he has got clients that he can evidence. And I was sending all my clients to him and I'm like, why am I doing this? I've got NLP. Why am I just not doing this myself? So in lockdown, I refreshed my skills and I used my client base to hone those skills. I worked for free in lockdown, which was a really nice feeling, but unfortunately, I can't do that ongoing. And I did a huge amount of mental health, chronic fatigue, all of that kind of stuff. I brought all of my skills together because I can go in the Akashic Records, which is the dimension that holds all of the history of our soul and every life it's ever had. And I can see whether this is a soul contract thing, a life purpose thing, whether it's a mechanism to help someone achieve something like strength, to break a victim mentality, whatever it might be. And I can help them to change behavior that isn't serving them. And for instance, nine times out of 10, someone who's got fibromyalgia doesn't have strong boundaries and they'll let people trample over those boundaries. But that's actually a problem because internally and subconsciously, they're not happy with that. Consciously, they might be going, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no problem. So they've got to learn to put those boundaries in place and respect them themselves as well. More often than not, fibromyalgia tends to come down to lack of self-work or lack of self-belief. And if I change what's created those beliefs and that behavior, then the health issue will go. So I see it a bit like Nanny McPhee. When you need her but want her, she'll come. And when you want her but don't need her, she'll go. (laughs) So it's quite a quick process, but it can be very profound depending on what it is that's actually needed at the root of everything. Yes, subconscious program is increasingly recognized as a profound influence in our behavior. And it's fascinating how the structure of language, as you've mentioned with NLP, can embed messages deep within our subconscious beyond our direct control. But it's possible to engage in a dialogue with our subconscious to understand and potentially recalibrate these messages. I think the challenge arises when we're predominantly left brain or too analytical to the point where it becomes difficult to access and adjust these subconscious imprints. And this often leads to being triggered into reactivity based on a historical mechanism. So in other words, reactive behaviors that are triggered by past experiences that suddenly surface. And in my work, I always advocate for a balanced approach where the logical left brain and the intuitive right brain work in harmony, because this dual perspective is especially crucial when dealing with chronic health issues which can be multifaceted and complex. And from my past experience in exercise referral, I've encountered various challenges. Could you share some common obstacles that you face in your practice and how do you address them? I think a big thing is that even those people who are spiritual and open-minded, because what I do is not mainstream, although like you say, there's a lot of people coming to the fore. Dr. Gabor Mate is really kicking around the dustbin, which is great. Dr. Joe Dispenza, he's got massive retreats where people literally can turn up in a wheelchair and leave on foot. And there's some other ones that are coming up as well. So people are very skeptical of anything that they don't know or don't understand. And of course, when you say to someone about beliefs, they will instantly think of something obvious, like whether they believe in God. They know if they believe in God or not. Yeah, but you don't know whether your six-year-old self felt humiliated because the teacher or the kids in class laughed when you read a book out loud or criticized you and left you going, oh my God, I'm stupid or whatever it is. That six-year-old self has filed that away, but your 45-year-old self doesn't want to get up and do a presentation at work because of the six-year-old self. If I come in and clear the six-year-old self's 
emotional issue, the 45 year old self doesn't hold on to it anymore. And they can get up and do a presentation, which might be a key part of their job. A lot of people that come to me fair play to them, they are just like, you know what, I'd go and see a budgerigar if it would make me well. They don't care if it makes sense. They don't need me to explain it and understand it. They just want sorting out because they've probably been through the NHS and the NHS is fabulous, but it's struggling massively so. And so some people aren't even bothering with the NHS. They'll just come to me and go, just sort me out. I don't want to go through the doctors. I don't need everything that comes with it. I don't want to do drugs. Sort me out. I'm not a big fan of labels, but I do like a label so I know what I'm working with. But I don't have to have a label like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. I can still get to the root of what is going on with them. Language shapes our reality in so many profound ways. And it's crucial not to let labels define us. Because I've had clients who say, I have fibromyalgia or I am diabetic. But these labels, especially when we identify with them, can only reinforce those conditions within our psyche because language has immense power and it is essential to use it wisely. The medical pressure does serve a vital role within its system. And while that system has its benefits... There is a growing movement now towards understanding the deeper causes of our conditions. And what I'm seeing is that this involves delving into the subconscious, as Bruce Lipton discusses, to uncover the roots of our health issues. And I foresee a future where communities embrace alternative treatments like herbal remedies and homeopathy, reclaiming practices that were once sidelined by those who prioritise profit in pharmaceuticals. And we're entering an era where ancient healing modalities, such as light and sound therapies used by the ancient Egyptians, are being revived worldwide. In my practice, I focus on identifying the underlying causes of health issues, addressing the associated beliefs or traumas, and fostering new constructive belief systems. Can you describe how you guide clients through this transformative process during a typical session? How do you help them uncover and address the root causes of their ailments? Okay. Firstly, there is no typical because it's very intuitive, but I'll give you an example. Okay. So I had a client who had um, two or three different issues going on. One was abandonment. The other was their health issue, which was gout, which they're not even a drinker. And the NHS and Western medicine would always say, oh, that's because too much alcohol build up uric acid. They're not a big drinker. So that's definitely not the case. So this client, they're in their 40s. So they're not a child. I asked them where in their body they felt the abandonment. And I can't remember. Let me say they took me to the heart chakra and I get them to give it a shape and a color and a size and a texture and then I ask them what they want to do with it so they might want to go I want to throw it away okay so I'll get them to do that either physically or just in their head it doesn't matter which and they'll do that and then we'll check and see if there's anything left and if there is we'll repeat it and if there isn't brilliant And then sometimes I will ask them to follow the thread that is attached to that and take me back to where that emotion started. Sometimes, depending on what it is, we'll start with the timeline and then do the other bit so it can move around. We went back and this actually happened a lot. So this is not having a go at anybody. They remembered being at nursery. Mum had taken them to nursery and the nursery worker said, when they're not looking, leave. And that was actually standard advice, I'm told, by some nursery teachers from that era, because the theory was they're so busy, they're quite happy, they're not going to miss you, and they're not going to have a big tantrum. But actually, that doesn't always work. And vice versa doesn't always work. Sometimes just saying goodbye, you do get the tantrum. And other times they're like, yeah, bye, mum, see ya, because there's something new for them to go and play with. So you can't legislate which way it's going to go. So for this particular client... They looked round and in the UK, for anyone listening from outside of the UK, children normally go to nursery school about the age of three-ish and that kind of fills a gap until they go to school at five. 
So this poor child suddenly turns around and mum, their main caregiver for the last three years, is missing. Meltdown. Okay, so of course, they don't remember this now. They're in their 40s. This is a dim and distant memory. And most people can't remember back to being that age anyway. So we followed the timeline thread and this memory came to the surface. And suddenly they're sobbing because they've been abandoned by their mum. So all these abandonment issues that play out in their workplace, their personal relationships, their family, pretty much everywhere, is suddenly now making sense because their parents are still together. They've never been abandoned. So there's no logical place for it to have come from. It turns out also that their gout was related to that abandonment because it's made them fearful of moving. And of course, the feet are about moving forwards because their safety and security was taken away all of a sudden. And every time they felt a bit insecure, even though they're now 45, the gout would flare up because it was there to keep them safe and protect them. So now I change that memory because their 45-year-old self will be, yeah, it's obvious what my mum did. She was just taking me to nursery. There was nothing to be worried about. So their adult self can make sense of it. They can explain it to their child self. Their child self will let go of it and go, yeah, it's nothing to worry about. So now that's no longer coming through into their present time. And depending on what it is that's happened, sometimes there might be a lot more work that's needed to be done on their belief system. There might have been an abusive parent-child relationship. So there's a lot of times when they felt powerless or useless or whatever it was. So that might take a bit more work or a bit of a different approach. But the underlying principle is the same. I just have to go and clear up whatever was going on at that point. And sometimes... It's an obvious belief to have created. Like kids, when they get told off, they'll automatically link that often to I'm not loved because criticism and love don't go together. So they can end up with this lifetime of feeling that they're not good enough or they're not loved purely because their parent was, I'm going to say telling them off, but actually they're trying to teach them boundaries. They're trying to teach them what you can and can't do. And so it's the little things that can have the biggest impact. And again, it's not to criticize parents or teachers or anyone else, because it isn't necessarily what the person doing it is intending. It's how we take it on the receiving end and how we interpret it. And then we go, ouch, and store it away. And then we're left with the problem. So it's actually quite easy to clear once you know what you're looking for, once you follow the breadcrumbs and go with it. In the early stages of life, there's a delicate dance between measurement and interpretation, because as children, we observe the world through our five senses, yet our prefrontal cortex, responsible for nuanced interpretation, may not be fully developed. And this creates a tension between what we perceive and how we make sense of it. So when we measure experiences through the lens of our primal instincts, such as fight or flight responses, then we often gauge situations based on survival instincts rather than a holistic understanding. And these early assessments driven by a need for safety or fear of punishment, can shape our behavioural patterns well into adulthood unless they are consciously examined and reframed. Your insight into the interplay of measurement and interpretation underscores a fundamental aspect of healing – in your extensive experience, have there been pivotal moments or revelations that have enriched your comprehension of the healing process? I think the standout one is that, and I haven't measured this completely because I haven't had the, the time, but it does appear that generally speaking, where somebody has the block, like this child who was abandoned by mum but wasn't abandoned where they felt it in their body instantly like oh I can feel that in the heart chakra 
is because it hurt them emotionally. But it was also in their feet, which is to do with their rootedness and their security, because they had no sense of security then. So it seems to line up with the chakra that governs the organ that's affected or the aspect of our energetic body. So for instance, oh, I was an only child and my parents never listened to me. I wasn't allowed to voice my opinion. Then I have problems in the throat chakra. They're likely to have thyroid dysfunction because they couldn't speak out. And the ear, nose and throat is all connected. So quite often the I'm not being heard will affect the same chakra. So the correlation is there. And often when I say to them, oh, give that a color, it quite often correlates with the color of the chakra, even though I haven't influenced them at all. I haven't said, oh, is it blue? Oh, no, it's red. I, I don't guide them in that way. I let it be very intuitive from then. I'd like to do a study and see if it's 100% every single time that the organ affected or the joint affected, the color and where else it's affecting them in their energy centers whether every single time it's the corresponding chakra. That definitely hit my radar a few times and made me go, oh. In the past, during workshops, I used to facilitate fascinating exercises which involved coloured discs and each representing a different hue of the spectrum. So red, orange, green, blue, indigo, violet. And through meditative practices, we explored how each color impacted our bodies. And we would acknowledge the subjective nature of that experience. But despite its subjectivity, this exercise allowed us to deeply connect with the visceral effects of color on our being. Because if you look at the color red as an example, and its presence in various aspects of life, especially in the UK, you've got the red post office boxes in the UK, you've got the alarming red bill, you've got the speeding ticket. So it really underscores its influence on our subconscious. And when I reflect on historical and cultural associations, such as the Romans' use of red and the symbolism of red buses, this further highlights the profound impact of colour on our psyche. And colour acts as a powerful cloak of force, and again, as an example, red symbolizing energy and action, which is akin to the pulsating arterial system, whereas conversely, blue is reminiscent of calmness and authority and mirrors the tranquil venous system. But you know what it's like if you're driving your car down the road and you're going over the speed limit and then you see a blue light in your rear view mirror and that prompts you to adjust your behavior or not. But the interplay between color and perception offers a rich tapestry for exploration. Within the realm of health and well-being, the diversity of experiences and challenges inspires me to continue offering my services because each interaction unveils new layers of understanding reinforcing the profound connection between mind, body and environment. What drives you to continue offering your services in such a diverse field? Probably because we've lost so many people and I see the toll that certain treatments take on them like chemo and radiotherapy. The long-term health implications are horrific. Osteoporosis, hair loss, long-term effects on the musculoskeletal system. But it's so unnecessary. And even just being on tablets for something like an underactive thyroid, you're on that for the rest of your life unless you balance that thyroid out. And obviously in the States, you've either got to get Medicare to pay for your prescriptions every month or you fund it yourself. And if you don't have medical insurance in the States, God help you. Over here, it's a lot better, but they are slowly changing the system, like more and more stuff is available over the counter rather than on prescription. And I just don't want to see people being in the system, the healthcare system, when they don't need to be, and that your body is able to heal itself. We've just forgotten how to heal it. And 
I think also a lot of people just want the easy fix. I'll take a tablet, have the cream, whatever. You don't need to think about it. But you haven't changed that internal state. So you're going to keep having more and more problems. And if you look at our society, we just seem to be getting sicker and sicker. It doesn't matter how many more new products they bring on the market. Everyone's just getting sick still. And so many people that I know just would much rather take back control of their health and look after their own health. And I think more and more people that I come across are understanding that there's a connection between what goes on in our life and what happens to us physically. That's huge. It's a very significant aspect because I believe many people suffer from paradigm blindness. And it's this prevailing mindset of just wanting someone else to fix us. But the truth is, we've got to step up and stand tall and own our well-being. It's about taking responsibility and being accountable for ourselves and realizing we've got to actively seek out knowledge and practices that support our body's natural innate healing mechanisms. Because let's face it, a lot of what we consume today, whether it's food or medication or drinks, tends to suppress that innate ability to heal. And then there's the whole issue of loneliness and lack of community, which is absolutely huge, and that's a whole other subject. But when we're isolated, it can really take a toll on our health. But when we come together, when we connect with others, there's this incredible support for our immunity. And it's like our collective strength becomes greater when we're in it together. It's very clear to me that you're not just about surface level treatments. You're diving deep. You're getting to the root causes of their health issues. And that's where the real transformation begins. How do you see the future of healing evolving? And where do you envision yourself within that landscape? One of the things that's cropped up recently is this thing that we're human and we're spiritual. We're not one or the other, we're both. And so my brain is working on something that brings the two together because when we accept that we're spiritual and have spiritual needs, therefore we can be having a better experience here on this planet. In terms of where health and wellness is going, I feel like there's a massive divide. Not quite sure what word to use for them. There's a structure in place called the People's Health Alliance, and it's gone global now. And everyone is starting up these little healthcare hubs across the UK and around the world. They're more and more integrative healthcare. So bring in Western medicine as well as the mind, body, spirit stuff. And there is more education. And so those people that are just like, no, doctors know best. And honestly, they're not interested in any other form. And then you've got the people to the far right who want to take back control of their life, their health, take agency for it, be educated. And there's this bit in the middle that's a bit of a no man's land. I feel like I'm heading towards those people that want to educate and want to give people the tools to take control of their own life and their own health and in some way try and enlighten those that are on the far left to bring them together because if I got hit by a car tomorrow and I'd got a shattered leg and needed surgery I'm not going to sit and chant oh I'm gonna go and have surgery on my leg but Marissa Peer said when they said to her she was never going to walk again she lay there in the bed working on her own health visualizing and sending healing to that leg By the time they got her in surgery, they go, I don't know what the doctor's on about. That's not that bad. So I I definitely agree that there's a time and a place where you call 999. But the rest of the time, I want to be the one working out what's going wrong and what I need to do to get rid of it so that I can be well. I want to talk to you about spirituality because that's been a lifelong passion for you, as we've spoken previously about. And that began at a young age. How has your understanding and practice of spirituality evolved over the years? Oh, goodness. It probably was more of a bolt on. I'm going to the gym. It's oh, I'm going to my development circle. And then I'd put it back in the box and go home and watch TV. Whereas now 
I speak to my spirit guides all the time, day in, day out. I'll go for a walk. I'll have a conversation with them. I'll meditate. I'll think about where my mindset is at when something's not right. Like I had a sinus infection a while ago. It's like, oh, who or what has got up my nose? What's irritating me? So I'll let my brain work on whatever that is that needs processing. When something crops up like a challenge in life, I'll sit and think, okay, so where's the element of growth here? What can I do? What tools have I got to help me deal with this? Do I need to shift a limiting belief? Do I need to be more open to something new? Do I need to just sit tight and trust the universe? So all of my different tools are there day in, day out. And now it's much more integrative. I don't really think about it as much as just do it. When you balance your spiritual exploration with the demands of everyday life, because I think for many people that can be quite challenging, how do you maintain a connection to your spiritual beliefs and your practices amidst the busyness of modern life? That's probably got easier, actually, because it is part of it. And I know that there's the saying that if you haven't got time to meditate for 10 minutes, you need to meditate for three hours. But I find other ways to bring in the meditation, like I might go for a run or a walk, or I might just sit and listen to some music or whatever. So I can squeeze little pockets in. I don't need to do great big, long sessions of anything there are times when something crops up like years ago there was that tsunami on christmas day in thailand and there's part of me that goes flipping egg how can that be something anyone has chosen to be part of but then my spiritual side will kick in and go okay so what has it taught the universe what have we gained from it what needs to be done differently going forwards and the same with lockdown a lot of people had a massive spiritual epiphany during lockdown they realized they didn't want to work so hard they realized they wanted to go and walk the dog in the woods with the family a bit more often and to a large extent that is still available to people because so many people don't commute then you've got those people that have drifted back to how it was but the world is not the same place and a lot of good has come out of the pandemic there's a lot of bad as well I think there was a stronger sense of community a lot more people have moved to alternative health during the pandemic because they couldn't get to a doctor even if they wanted to so I always believe out of adversity something good will come. We have to sometimes look for it rather than it being immediately obvious. But those sorts of tools get me through whatever life throws at me, whether that's a bereavement, whether that's an event or a situation, there's always something I can do with it. Have there been any significant moments or a confluence of moments of spiritual awakening or any rising realizations that have profoundly impacted your path? Yes is the easy answer. I'm not sure at the time that I saw them as spiritual, but now I look back, I can. Like a big defining moment for me, my parents divorced when I was about six and I stayed with my dad, which was highly unusual in the early 80s. But I went to visit my mum And my dad rang and went, oh, you're always really over the moon when you go and see your mum. We thought you might want to stay there. My almost 12-year-old self went, oh, he doesn't want me. He doesn't love me anymore. (laughs) Okay, then yes, I'll stay with mum. When what I really wanted to do was like, no, I want to come home and be with you. But I know really full well if I had stayed where I was, which was deepest, darkest Norfolk, where not a lot was happening back in the day, I just wouldn't have what I've got now. I just wouldn't because I'd have lived in a different area. I'd grown up there. It was quite rural where I lived. It's a decent trip into the nearest big town, which would have been Norwich. Whereas where I am in Kent, which is where I eventually landed, there is just so much happening on my doorstep. And I just felt like somehow I was guided to be here. And funny enough, my partner was good friends with someone who actually turned out to be a relative. And I didn't even know that when I moved here. So we always laugh about the fact he knew my family here before I did. So I feel like I've come full circle. I feel like I've come home. But if you'd have asked me at age 12, if I'd have wanted to do something because amazing things were going to come from it, but didn't tell me what they were, 
I'm pretty sure they're going, no, I just want to go home to my dad. Is that right? But everything unfolded from there. So it needed to happen. And yet it was painful and it took me a long time to get over it. But now I can look back and see the sense and I can go, oh, yeah, do you know what? I'm really glad that happened. I just wish that I didn't have to have the painful bit that went with it. But it's what makes us grow. So if we did that, there's no growth. You have to see the bigger picture and look at what it's brought you instead and go, I don't want to change anything because I want what I have now and I want who I am now. Yeah, I'll take that pillar again. Thanks very much. Just because I'll have what I've got. Sometimes seeds are planted and they're not ready to bloom yet, but the seed's been put in the ground and it has its timings. But we have our timings, but there are its timings as well. And we don't always take that into account. How do you see your role as a spiritual guide in today's world? I think there's more and more call for it. And part of the brain download process I've been having recently is that I have a lot of knowledge from my own journey, from working with clients, my own spiritual practice. And if there is such a thing as a spirit guide on earth, without wanting to sound up myself, I actually feel like I can help a lot of people by helping them understand how to be a spiritual person having a human existence. And I'm not the only one. And there's lots of people that are able to do the same thing. When we're looking at addressing our inner community, our inner being, that is what is in this body, what is in this mind, what is in this psyche and these emotions and this psychology in these behaviours, it often involves facing our own limitations and fears What has been some of the most significant challenges you've encountered on your journey? Oh, God. I think a lot of mine happened in the first half of my life. And then I spent the middle section dealing with that. And then I reaped the rewards more so in my later years. So definitely the challenges around feeling loved and feeling wanted and confidence, self-esteem, self-worth, they were huge things until I was 17. And then from 17 onwards, I started healing myself from those through friends, through family, through self-development, through my spiritual stuff, through my partner. That's all been a major part of getting me to be who I am now. And I feel like this part of my life is about being able to help people that maybe don't know how to get it for themselves. I was always very curious. So I always read loads of books. And now with the internet, I read loads on the internet. I watch loads of videos. But we didn't have that when I was growing up. So we were quite limited. But there are a lot of people that go, I know I need something different, but I haven't got a clue where to start. And I think I'm fairly well equipped to understand what they've been through and show them the path that can lead to their development. You run, you read, you mention spending time with loved ones, and those are important aspects of life. Well, in fact, of anyone's life, if they choose to do so. Were there any key realizations or moments of clarity that have propelled you forward on your personal growth journey? God, there's probably loads. I'm just trying to think of them. I think the overriding one is always knowing that there's something more that I could be doing. And again, it isn't always about me doing it because I can only learn so much in any one lifetime. And I'm not about to go and be a brain surgeon or train to be a psychiatrist. I can still learn about what's new and have interest in new things and share that with people so that they can follow that path. So sometimes I'm the conduit. But I would like to do more workshops for my own development. Uh, And so this year it's about rebalancing so I can learn more because that's the knowledge that I use to help people that are crossing my path. So I think it's always about understanding what else is out there so that I can share it. The way we learn today is just as important in terms of how we learn and what we learn. And when you look ahead, what are some key areas of personal development you're currently focused on and how do you envision them shaping your future? There's some big changes coming up for me because my partner's 
quite a bit older than me and we need to be spending some time together. A lot of what I'm into, he's taken on. So when he's got a health problem, he will look to himself for answers, which is good. And he's done that quite a bit in more recent times. Also, I want to work smarter, not harder. And I want to be able to do more for more people, but without having to work 24 hour days and 24 hour nights. I want to be able to put all of my skills together in a way that help people the most and free me up to spend time with the people that are important to me. As our conversation comes to a close, I'm deeply grateful to you, Tracy, for the insights and wisdom that you shared and your unique approach to healing and spiritual development, which I see serves as a beacon of hope for those navigating their own paths towards wellness and enlightenment. And from your origin story to your current offerings in intuitive coaching and Reiki healing, it's evident to me that your passion and dedication is truly transformative. So I encourage all of our listeners to explore your work further and embark on their own journey towards healing and self-discovery. So again, I want to thank you for joining me today. But before we part ways, I want to welcome you to the Soul Spotlight. So the first question I want to ask you is, what does it mean to live authentically to you? And how do you strive to align your actions with your true self? I take a long, hard look at myself a lot. Sometimes that probably airs a little bit towards judgmental uh, and I have to rein that in because I am very critical of myself. But we're here to give, we're here to help. So I'm always looking for that way to be able to give a bit more, but without it costing me in the wrong way. And I am just intuitive. If something feels wrong, I won't do it. Okay, so if we hadn't have connected when we chatted that time and I felt you weren't the right person to talk to, I wasn't right for you, I would have just said, no, do you know what? It's not right. And I'm the same with people who come to me for a reading or for healing. If I don't think I'm the person they need, I will tell them that I'm not the person. And if I know the person that they should be with, I will send them to them. So I just let my gut guide me and I don't have to understand if it feels wrong, why. I just have to know that it feels right or it feels wrong and act accordingly. Great. And how do you practice self-care and nurture your inner well-being amidst life's demands and challenges? It is tricky. And I did add up all these things that these experts tell us to do. And I wouldn't have time to go to work, if I'm brutally honest. I'm a morning person, which is great because I like to get up. And especially in the summer, I like to go for a run before it's too hot and no one can see the sweatiness running along the seafront. So I do a lot of stuff in the morning. I'm learning Spanish. I go for a run. I do a gratitude diary and a wind diary. And between all of those, I probably spend about an hour and a half tops maybe a little bit less, actually. I love to read, so I don't care if I'm reading fiction or if I'm reading self-development books or spiritual books or a mix. I quite often have multiple books on the go and I'll dip in and out. Because if you read a chapter a day of something, that's better than, oh, I haven't got time and not starting. So things like meditation, I build those into other things that I'm doing. So I might go for a drive somewhere like to a networking meeting and I'll have a chat with my guides whilst I'm doing it and get any questions answered that I need. I might go for a walk and just let my spirit guides give me inspiration and so I try not to plug myself into tech too much which is very tempting in our day and age but sometimes it's just really nice to get away from tech and to just be alone with my thoughts which is probably quite a rare thing these days. I eat well I'm lucky that my other half's an amazing cook because he cooks really great food. But I do like to get in the kitchen when I get a chance. So I think I've got a very well-rounded care regime. And I do like to get to bed nice and early because I like my eight hours. And if I'm going to get up at six o'clock, I need to go to bed early. (laughs) So I'm not perfect. You know, there are nights and days where I don't do those things. But predominantly, that's my routine. And can you share a moment where you felt deeply connected to something greater than yourself and how did it shape your perspective on life? There was a reading that I did. I think it was a platform one, which is where you stand up and go around the audience. 
and I connected to someone's loved one and all I could feel was this overwhelming love enough to make me want to choke up and cry and I'm not someone that cries at the drop of a hat it was just such an amazing feeling and ordinarily I would give them a lot more information to go on but I told them what I was getting and they knew instantly who was connecting with me and actually I think everyone in the audience once I described what I was feeling they were as choked up as me but the love was just so overwhelming and you will get people that talk about cold reading where we read the audience and there was just no way you that could have been a cold read I don't even know how to cold read but that was just so powerful and it was almost like a Mexican wave of emotion just swept through the whole room and it was just like wow and I didn't need any words because the feeling was just so immense and I think that's a definite standout moment to prove that love transcends death on every occasion. That's beautiful. And do you have any parting words or a message you want to leave with the audience? And where can people find you? Okay. So I would definitely say, regardless of where your interest lies, tap into your intuition because on day-to-day needs, your intuition is there to help serve you. You might not want to do readings or healing, that's fine. But definitely tap into that intuition and work with it as closely as you possibly can. You'll be so grateful that you did. I would never, ever want to lose my intuitiveness because I think it would make me a much lesser person and a much unhappier person. So definitely tap into that. I'm on most platforms. You can find me on Facebook as Tracy Fance Psychic Coach. There's my website, which is tracyfance.com, Instagram, Tracy Fance Psychic Coach, and Twitter. I think I'm just Tracy underscore Fance. But if you Google me, I come up quite high because I'm everywhere. A heartfelt thank you to you, Tracy, for sharing your time, your expertise and passion with us and your dedication to helping others heal and grow is truly commendable. And I'm honoured to have had this opportunity to learn from you and I wish you continued success on your journey and may your light continue to shine brightly for all those who seek guidance and healing. So thank you once again for being with us today. Thank you. And thank you for those lovely words. That's really so important. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of Transcendent Minds. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you feel inclined, please leave a rating and a review as this goes a long way. And follow us on social media to stay up to date with the latest episodes. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, keep transcending your mind.